All right, now I gave a talk a little bit ago on the characteristics of woodland wildflowers. There'll be a little bit, but not much overlap with this talk. So those of you who sat through the first one can think about chocolate Easter bunnies <laughs> while we go through those slides again. Uh, as I said before in the other talk, I am not a botanist. My PhD is entomology. I've spent most of my career working on conservation issues involving rivers. So I'm not an expert on plants. What I'm going to tell you about are things I've learned by doing. So this is not a professional botany talk by any means. So let's see if we can get started here. I also realize at 12.15, most people are already eating lunch, so I'm not only the speaker before lunch, I'm the speaker during lunch, <laughs> which won't be served till after I'm done, so that puts a little pressure on me. Okay, when my daughter was eight, she came to me and wanted to do a Kool-Aid sale. I had been growing woodland wildflowers as a hobby for several years because the house we moved into was full of them because the people who lived there had physical disabilities and just let the yard go. And it was full of really cool plants and I got interested in them. So I told my daughter that everybody does Kool-Aid sales, let's do something different. Let's weed the garden and see if we can sell all these wild plants. <laughs> so we potted a few up, put four signs up at the grade school, and in less than two hours, probably much less than two hours, she had sold all the plants and had $400 in cash, at which point a light bulb went in on Dad's head. And all through grade school, high school, and my son all through college, they made their spending money growing, propagating from seeds and cuttings, woodland wildflowers, and selling them in the local market, which was usually like a garage sale in my yard. And as my kids grew older, um, neighborhood kids started getting involved and others and my kids used to hire their friends to come on wildflower day and the girls here they moved a thousand pots one day from the backyard to the front yard and there's my son taking plants to somebody's car and it turned into a pretty big deal and this is one of the signs we had early on a very simple sign these were put up around the neighborhood and ultimately around town and by the time they were in high school my daughter would write ads for the newspaper and things like that. Now marketing is something, now I know most of you aren't going to go out and sell woodland wildflowers and things to think about is if you want to do a project or make a little money on the side doing this or weed your garden for profit or your woodlot, whatever you've got, I know a lot of you have um, have woods, which I don't, but we have done such things as we've sold them in our yard like a garage sale, we've done the local farmers market, we've worked with organizations that are trying to raise funds, we've sold a few things to landscapers and uh, wildflower nurseries, and we haven't done this. If you want to actually try to make a living at this as opposed to extra money, you've got a lot of work to do and there's a lot of very good competition and some of the people who are selling wildflowers are on the handout I gave out. So the thing we've done here is a small project. I think the most the kids ever made in a year was $5,000 and they were making a whole lot more than they would have made working at McDonald's for the same amount of hours. They also had IRAs when they were 16. <laughs> Roth, not the other kind. Um, here's my son when he was in high school with some of the neighbor kids making labels for the plants. You've got to have labels or people don't know what they've got. Here's little girls in middle school. That day she, with very little, you've got to give these kids a little responsibility. With very little supervision, she, brought, she handled $2,300 as people came through the line buying plants. People were fanatic about these things. This is about 1990, I think. A terrible downpour. I mean, it rained like you wouldn't believe, and it was wildflower day, so people came from all over the place. <laughs> My daughter had a mailing list of 400 people by the time she stopped doing this, and it went from Urbana, Illinois to Chicago. Here's a shot of our driveway with the tables up one year. 
you can see there's a whole lot of plants there. And they were all from the yard. This is the Grand Prairie Friends Sale in Urbana, Illinois. It's held every Mother's Day weekend on Saturday. The, all the local plant groups get together. The Grand Prairie Friends sells prairie plants. Me and my kids sell woodland wildflowers. The Hosta Society sells hostels and the... Uh, <laughs> you caught that. <laughs> and the um, African Violet people, everybody's there and it's a great time. Lots of people sell. Now, to get a little more serious, this book is something you should probably all look at if you have any land that could support a native plant. It's called Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Tallamy. I think it's the next Silent Spring. In a very few readable chapters, he points out why it's important to bring back native plants. And I'm not going to dwell on that in this talk. I did that last talk, but the thing to keep in mind is that many of our native insects, like the monarch, are adapted to a certain group of plants, in this case milkweed. And things like the genus Quercus, the oak trees, in the United States and North America, they support over 500 different butterflies and moths, particularly in the larval stage. A lot of the plants, the trees that are being brought in from other parts of the world because they're cheap or ornamental, our butterflies and moths and bees cannot use them. Many of the beetles can't use them. Some of the bees can use them for pollen and nectar. But basically, we are eliminating much of our heritage and our children's heritage by eliminating the native plants. If you go to new subdivisions, what do they do? They have a thing they call mass grading. I call it mass degrading. They scrape all the soil off, then they build the houses and they sell the topsoil, and what goes back is grass and non-native ornamentals. Uh, this is one of those areas at Carlinville, Illinois, where I did some of my research in the 1970s, early 70s. This is a woods being turned into a subdivision where people can live in the woods. Now, those of you who remember the Vietnam War heard of saying that when something like we had to destroy the village in order to save it, we had to destroy the woods in order to live in it. This used to be what that looked like. But when the developers come in, they get rid of most of the trees, leave enough for a house, all the understory is gone, and you've got grass and a few trees, but certainly nothing that resembles a woods. Road commissioners all over the country discovered herbicides. They're spraying the rural roadsides, killing a lot of the woody vegetation, but very importantly, all the understory when they use their herbicides in this manner. Telephone cables are going in. I guess not telephone cables anymore. Wireless cables. Cables going in all over the country. In rural areas, they just take their machine trench on through, put the subsoil on top, topsoil on the bottom, the soil insects, the plants get buried, and you've got an area that's perfect for invasive plants to move in very quickly. Now we're going to talk a little about invasive plants. I tend to think of invasive plants like a Persian horde, where in you have situations historically where a group of people more sophisticated than others would make a phalanx of sorts and they would march across the countryside taking over everything. Notice the little Persian hats. Okay, so here's teasel in Illinois along a highway. This is an invasive plant. It's very similar to a phalanx marching across the landscape complete with the little Persian hats. <laughs> now, the problem is with an invasive plant like this, or some of the things like uh, canary grass, and particularly garlic mustard, is they take over the entire area, whether it's a prairie, a wetland, or a woodland. The whole understory of this woodland area is completely dominated by garlic mustard. Very little light reaches the floor, and in the spring, the garlic mustard seeds germinate before the native plant seeds 
and they create a canopy at ground level which shades out the seeds. Things like uh, bush honeysuckle along the edge of woodlands completely shade out the edge of the woods and going into the woods quite a distance to the point where virtually nothing can grow under the honeysuckle. And autumn olive is an edge plant, but certainly not much better, despite the fact that there's some lycopene in it. There's lycopene in tomatoes. Forget the autumn olive. <laughs> if you want to grow these things, even if you've got a woodlot, it might have been a woodlot that had pigs running in it or cattle or something at one point. There might not be much natural left. But if you want to try and restore things, it's important to look at a kind of a natural wooded area, if you can find one, and learn a little bit about what's there. Rotting logs, particularly with bark, are good. A few standing trees that are dead are good. Leaf litter in moderation is good. You want to leave the soil insects in place, especially some of the ants, which not only turn over the soil, but are important for distributing the seeds of plants like trillium and bloodroot. And um, what I do with my leaves, because I've only got a house, not a whole woods, is I mulch them. I run them through the mower twice and make an oak leaf mulch, and we use that to mix with our soil for propagating these plants. Here's some ants. This is, uh, let's see, that would be Pranolepis imparisae, taking seeds from trillium. Now, I have a two-hour video of these ants taking these seeds off of this trillium, starting when the trillium was a bulb and going down to just nothing. And some of my friends showed it in a bar one night, and the patrons, <laughs> the patrons were either drunk or fascinated, but a lot of people sat through the whole thing. <laughs> he, he asked me to borrow the thing. He was going to show it at a Sierra Club meeting or something, but he actually showed it in a bar. So anyway, the ants are important. Bloodroot, trillium, uh, trout lily, a lot of plants. The seeds are distributed. So if you get some of these plants going, chances are good. If you haven't had the ants killed off by a prior owner, you're okay. If you're dealing with a company that wants to improve your lawn, let them use fertilizer, but don't let them put herbicide and insecticide in the fertilizer unless you have an absolutely necessary problem because you don't want to kill the soil ants. And 70% of our native bees nest in the soil. The soil insecticide does not help them either. Here's some bees that most of you probably haven't ever seen. These are some of our, most of these are, that's not a native, but these three are native bees. There are 6,000 bees in the United States of America. There were 300 different species at Carlinville, Illinois, where I did some of my early research. All of these bees have their own personalities and habits and places they live. <laughs> but 70% of them live in the ground. The other 30% mostly live in twigs, stems, reeds, cracks in trees, stuff like that, they're cavity nesters. Uh, most bee species are not hive species. They're not social like honeybees and bumblebees. Honeybees and bumblebees comprise about 45 species in the United States. The other 6,000 are semi-social or mostly non-social. In that case, many times the, the female mates and then she raises the young on her own, or I should say provisions the cells since bees, these bees don't actually raise their young. They're active as adults for a short time. There are spring bees that come out in March or April and are completely finished with their work in a few weeks to a couple months. They dig a hole in the ground or a, a, a stem or something, provision the cell with pollen and nectar, lay their egg, and then the immature bee stays in that hole, in that cell, until the following spring. Their other bees come out only in the fall. Honeybees, bumblebees, and a bunch of others are out all year. Take home message there is you need to have things growing in your woods, in your yard, in your prairie, wherever you have, that are in bloom at various parts of the season and that will provide pollen and nectar. A lot of non-native or cultivar plants don't provide the necessary pollen or nectar for many of our species. A lot of our bees, like the monarch, are associated with a certain type of plant. That's where they get their pollen. They cannot feed their young the wrong kind of pollen. 
Other bees like honeybees are generalists and can use almost anything. To give you an idea of some of the diversity, I'm just going to deal with the bees, but there's long and short tongued bees. This is spring beauty, Claytonia virginica. There's 21 long tongue like bumblebees and 37 short tongue like andrina type bees on that plant. Um, here's Claytonia virginica, some data. Historically at Carlinville, Illinois between 1884 and 1916, Charles Robertson collected insects on 441 different plants. It was his life's work. He developed one of the best databases in the world for insect plant associations and he dealt mainly with bees but did a whole lot of other things. Interesting information is that I went back to that same area in 1970 and 71 when I was an undergraduate student and collected bees for two seasons. And for Claytonia virginica, the spring beauty, his data and my data pretty much matched on species richness. There was no real change. Of, of the bees he collected there on all of the plants he worked on that I was able to recollect, I got 80% of the species he had, which was rather remarkable after 75 or 80 years. Part of the study was repeated again by researchers from Washington University, headed by Burkle. They only found half as many species of spring bees as were found in the prior studies. Um, a lot of the trees also are very good for bees. I'm not going to belabor the point, but here's uh, Prunus serotina, which is one of the wild cherries. You can see here it's got a, a flower that's much smaller, and there's like seven long tongue and 23 short tongue bees were collected on that, along with many other insects. Some things to think about if you want to grow or propagate wild flowers, there's some work involved. How much work is up to you? You can spend an inordinate amount of time doing it or just a little and the rewards are commensurate with the effort. You want to propagate plants, you don't want to dig them from the wild. If you own your own property and have these already on your property, you can dig and experiment a bit, but it's, it's good to know a little bit about the plant before you try and dig or you'll probably kill it. There's plant diseases out there that your plants can get. There's a uh, fungus that attacks Jack in the Pulpit, for example that if you don't have it on your property, you probably won't get it. Plants are on their schedule, not yours. Uh, some years, the plants will start growing in late March. If the winter's rough, it might be <coughs> April. So you can't really predict too readily when these plants are going to be available. You want to make sure you've got the associated insects. You've got some, leave the ants alone, have some logs and other things in the area. The same thing that the turkey people say and the deer people and the others, you need diversity in your habitat. Genetic diversity is important. If you want to start propagating Jack in the Pulpit, for example, don't take all your seeds from one plant or you'll end up inbreeding everything. You need to have a variety of sources and if you're trying to propagate, it's good to work on a number of species because it's much more interesting there's all kinds of places to get information. Universities Extension, a really good place are some of the greenhouses and nurseries that sell native plants. They have excellent articles, particularly on prairie plants since they're more popular, but some on woodland. And there's organizations like the Xerxes Society that's on the handout that will be glad to share information. Okay, now to get into growing things. One of the most important things about growing woodland wildflowers is they go dormant. And they totally disappear and they've got a, usually an underground rhizome or bulb. This is my front yard, a little piece of it. Notice the straws. The blue straws are supposed to be marking bluebells. The red straws are supposed to be marking jack in the pulpits, etc. I always run out of one color and they all get mixed up. <laughs> but it's important to mark if you want to <coughs> propagate some of these things like with jack in the pulpit you'll want to dig up the bulb in the fall after it's gone dormant because there's lots of little bulbs around it that you can then move around. A lot of these plants, you can dig them up when they're dormant, you won't hurt them, and you can transplant them to other places or to pots to sell or whatever. You put in raised beds. The bottom line is you've got to be able to find them. If you don't mark them, you're going to do a lot of digging and killing without any good purpose. I use straws because they're plastic and they don't go away. If you try and use wooden sticks, they rot. 
If you use Sharpies, after two months, you'll find you can't read them. If you want to write on a plastic tag or something, go to the pig store and buy a pig tag ear marker. It's paint. Most farm stores have cow tags for cow ear tags and pig ear tags. They work very well. The, the marker for those works very well. You need to protect things from vermin like squirrels. If you've got a lot of things I do when I start my seedlings, I raise them in trays, standard 20 by 10 trays or whatever I have that's handy. And you can get a lot of things. This is a standard uh, greenhouse size tray. This somebody was throwing away from their refrigerator. You can set that over an individual plant in the ground or over a tray and it'll help keep the squirrels and other critters away from it. It won't do much for a deer if the deer kicks it, but it makes a big difference. It also keeps a lot of kids from stepping out. There you see Jack in the Pulpit seedlings in a standard 10 by 20 inch uh, greenhouse tray with another tray over the top. One thing about Jack in the Pulpit, they've got three leaves after the first year. The first year they've got one. Here's a screen they use at a lot of universities. It's like six by six. You can lift it up very easily and work under it. There's all kinds of trays under that that you can't see very well. Another useful thing is shade cloth or window screens. I put window screens or shade cloth down in the fall. And there's usually seedlings in a tray like this with lots of holes. You've got to make lots of holes for your drainage so you don't want it too wet. These do several things. They keep birds from stepping on your plants in the spring, but most importantly, during the spring rains, they break up the force of the raindrops. If you've got little tiny seedlings or seeds, like uh, say you had uh, bloodroot seeds in here, or something really tiny like columbine, the raindrops are like little bombs. They hit, they splash, they knock the seeds out. If you cover it with something like this, much of the force of the raindrop is broken. Here are some trays I grow seedlings in or small plants. I, I grow seeds in trays like this and also transplant seedlings into trays like this. The important thing is it doesn't matter so much what they look like. Deeper ones are a little better than shallow ones for a lot of plants, but the thing is they have lots of holes in them. I bury these in the ground at ground level. So the capillary action of the moisture in the soil is pretty much the same in the soil as it is in the tray. If you ever worked in greenhouses and tried to propagate things, you know the moisture level in your pots and trays is either too much or too little most of the time. So if you basically do something like this, the soil moisture is the same inside and outside your tray. Additionally, in the fall or whenever you want to go work on these, if you want to transplant seedlings in May to sell, you pop that sucker out of the ground, take it in a nice warm, dry place, and you can work on it when it's raining, you can work on it when it's cold, you can transplant into pots. It's very easy to handle this way. If they're in the ground, you, A, you can't find them, and B, if the ground's frozen or it's too wet, it's a mess. So that just makes life easy. You can use grow bags. There were 250 false Solomon seal in this grow bag. They were after two years. I threw a handful of seeds in there. It's like a fire and forget missile. You put them in the bag, you cover them with soil, come back in two or three years and you've got 250 seedlings. You can't do that with all plants, but you can do it with a lot of them. When I say this is work, we had 250 marketable seedlings for the amount of time it took to put some soil in a grow bag, bury the bag and come back in three years. So it doesn't have to be intensive. Here's some of our stuff getting ready for a sale. My kids spent a couple hours one weekend potting these and a few more hours the weekend before getting them ready, but it didn't take much time. But you can see a lot of these plants are growing in the pots. Some you can put in the pots in the fall, some you have to wait till spring, but you can get a lot of pots filled quickly. Um, most of our plants we overwintered in trays or raised beds. We covered them with things that would keep squirrels out, and then we put a layer of uh, leaf litter on top. Usually we mow the leaf litter twice, and then we put a few full-size leaves, full leaves on top. 
The thing you want to do is keep the uh, seedlings and the plants insulated. It probably doesn't hurt them to freeze once or twice, but having some insulation on top helps a lot. Here's one of our beds getting ready to be covered with shade cloth in the fall. You can see we tried to color code the pots, but by the time spring rolls around and they start growing, it's pretty easy to tell what they are. But if you're trying to get them organized before they come out, it's good to have a color code. We don't have a greenhouse, but our neighbor let us use a shed that had a window in one side and the temperature was usually a little bit warmer. So we would often put plants that were a little slower in this shed so they would be blooming about the same time the normal plants would bloom and then we could sell things all at the same time. You can buy seeds, you can buy cuttings, you can buy uh, potted plants from many nurseries. Prairie Moon here in Wisconsin sells seeds for many plants, again mostly prairie plants, in two dollar packets that are very handy if you want to start small. Uh, let's talk about how to grow some of these. Let's check the time too. Okay. Spring Beauty, Claytonia virginica, the great bee plant. Something to know about it. It's got a little nut-like bulb and it sends out shoots in the spring. When it's done, when, when the canopy closes over, the plant goes dormant. What most people don't know is this plant and Jacob's Ladder and several others will also send out shoots in the fall if weather conditions are right, the tree canopy's gone, and it can get some sunlight. So you may want to be careful spraying at certain times of the fall. If you're trying to get rid of garlic mustard, you might want to make sure you don't have your Claytonia up. Um, here's another picture of Claytonia virginica. There's a large, that's probably 20 years old. They send out a shoot so the, the nutlet can be a foot or more from where the flowers are. These plants, like many of the woodland wildflowers, they have a variety of flowers on the stem. The ones at the top can be blooming, while the ones at the bottom have already got a seed that's fairly ripe. Can you hear me in the back yet? Okay. Now, collecting seeds from these, and you want to be careful collecting seeds in your woods or anybody else's area. You don't want to take a large fraction of seeds. I try to take no more than 10%. One of the problems with a lot of the woodland plants, like Jacob's Ladder and this one, is they're flowering at the top, they're ripe at the bottom. The solution is, unless you want to pick each one of these individually, is to wait till a reasonable number of them are ripe in the center section, pick the stem, pinch it off, throw it in a bag or a tray, let it dry completely, then shake it a lot, and you'll have hundreds and hundreds of seeds which you can spread on the soil in a tray. In the first year, they'll come up looking like grass. These are, I think this is the second year on these, but they're very narrow grass-like blades. You can grow hundreds of them in a tray, and after the first year, they look like grains of brown rice. The second year, they're a little bigger. After five years, they're about the size of a, uh, well, let's see, after four years, they're about the size of a pea. Here's some examples. This is one year old. That's probably four years old. That's probably 20 years old. A bulb like this can put out 20 or 30 flowering stems and dominate an area a foot across. These are very hard to find the nutlet because where the nutlet is could be a foot or more from where you see the stem. Mayapple, very easy to grow. It's not a bee plant. I think it's pollinated by beetles. This is a growing area. Um, my kids have taken at least 100 bluebells and at least 50 to 100 mayapples out of this every year for 20 years. This area is roughly Oops, roughly 12 feet by 15 feet on each side. So this is the mayapple area. This is the bluebell area. You'll see them later. But look at the density of mayapples in this area. Some of these plants can grow extremely densely. And when it's time to harvest them, you can find them rather easily if they're dense like this. 
the best time to harvest something like a May apple is early in the spring when it's just starting to come out of the ground. You can cut around it without hurting the other plants, put it in your tub, and then put it in a pot. Um, we do seeds as well. Uh, when the May apple seeds are ripe in the pod, it goes from green to yellow or brown. If you wait too long, some animal will get it, even in town. So we frequently take them in the yellow stage. We tease the seeds out of the pulp, put them in a pot, and these, I believe, are, yes, these are two years old. And there's a two-year-old um, rhizome. But here's the, the plant, and at the end of the season, this is what they look like. You let them go a few years, and they make a full-size plant. And each plant has a node periodically, and from the node, two or three new shoots will come off. And in the spring, you can, you can harvest these in the fall, like, and cut them off like that, or you can get them in the spring when they start to sprout, you can cut that off. But again, you wanna make sure you're doing this in your own property, or you've got good permission from a neighbor, and you don't wanna to take too many, and you wanna have a variety of them so your genetic material is mixed up. Bluebells, another nice plant. The bluebells are a nightmare to collect seed from because these various flowers, when you turn the flower over, You'll see if they've all been pollinated, there's four seeds per each bloom. The seeds fall out very easily when they're ripe. They're pointed down so you can't see which ones have seeds. So you do what the, you do with Claytonia. It's basically you know when a bunch of them are ripe. You pick a reasonable number of the stems and then you plant them. Now bluebells are interesting. If you heard my other talk about how plants fight for dominance, Bluebells grow up 18 inches to two feet tall. When the seeds are ripe, they go completely dormant after the seeds ripen in fall. The bluebells will be completely invisible about the end of May, at least in central Illinois. When they go dormant, they fall over like a giant sequoia. The seeds are at the end of the stalk. The seeds fall away from what I call the mother plant so that the mother will not shade the new seedlings. Now, this has a very neat effect for propagating. This is our, our bluebell propagating area, which is immediately adjacent to the May apples. And the older plants grow up, do their seeds and their sequoia thing where they fall over. But there's all kinds of seedlings growing up around these <coughs> mature plants. The easiest way to propagate bluebells is to let them grow in a pattern like this. Every two years, come and take the, the leaves, take the little plants that are obviously two to three years old out of the ground. They're not tiny. There's first year seedlings. You can see they're growing off on the edges. Here's what a seedling looks like early on. This one is two years old. They begin to grow these carrot-like rhizomes, and you want to get them when they're a little bit bigger than this. They're very easy to dig up, they're very hardy, they're very easy to put in a pot or move to somewhere else on your property. Those are the ones you want. You can get them in the fall, but they're a real lot harder to deal with. Bluebells grow big, and eventually they grow huge. Now, if you Try to dig a bluebell that's mature, you're almost invariably going to shatter it because it's hollow. We did the bunny thing earlier, so we won't do it now, but they're like a hollow chocolate bunny. They shatter easily, so if you try to dig the mature plants up, you're going to have a mess. And this is giving you an idea of what they look like. I cut those off so you can see the inside. They shatter. Jack in the pulpit, one of my favorite plants. You can collect the berries in the fall. Each one of these red berries has one or up to six seeds in it. The seeds can be a quarter inch across or less than an eighth of an inch. You take a handful of the berries, you put it in a container with water, you s smush the berries with your hand, to use a scientific term, get the seeds separated from the pulp. 
Some people are sensitive to the juice, so you might want to wear rubber gloves. It didn't bother me much, but some people might get a rash. You put them in a pot or a tray or the ground. I prefer pots or trays because you want to keep track of the seeds and you can control things. Seeds have a high mortality rate, but if you take care of them, you can get almost 100% germination. And here's what Jack in the Pulpit looks like early on. The seedlings have one leaf. The, the second year plants have, two, have three leaves. Same is true of green dragon. The way you tell them apart is the green dragon, after two years, one leaf is larger than the other two. And of course, when they start blooming, they're easy to tell apart. Um, Jack in the Pulpit is a plant that doesn't mind being crowded. I put something like uh, 150 or 200 seeds in this five inch pot in the fall. This young lady is holding it in the spring. This guy is holding the tray in the fall and we got 156 bulbs out of that pot. Now they're not very big, but if you would take those bulbs into your woods and stick them in the ground, you take a screwdriver, make a hole, a, quarter to a half inch deep, drop the bulb in, close it over. It's very easy to plant. Or you put them in a bigger tray or in the ground and the next year they'll get bigger and the next year they'll get bigger. And after three to four years, they're probably marketable. But here's a variety of Jack in the Pulpit bulbs. They go anywhere from a BB size up to a small potato. This bulb might be 20 years old. And remember, mature bulbs often have buds on them, and if, if you were to plant this bulb the next year and dig it up, there would be at least four bulbs, probably that size, surrounding the mother bulb. Wild geranium, very difficult plant to collect <coughs> seeds from because they are dehiscent. They're spring-loaded. When the seeds get ripe, like you see, this one's almost ripe, this spring engages, and this is like a sling on a spring, and the seed is propelled six to eight feet out. So if you plant these in your woods, plant them every so often, and they will take care of themselves by flinging seeds around the place. If you try to pick these by hand, you can do it, but you basically have to find them when they're just about ripe and ready to pop. You gotta put your fingers around them, squeeze them so they don't pop in your hand, throw them in a bag or a bottle, and then explode in the bottle. You do not want to get hit in the eye by one of these seeds. You need glasses, safety glasses, if you're going to collect seeds from these. The seeds are very viable in most cases. This is a baby, has two cotyledons, but almost immediately you can tell it is a geranium. <coughs> Geraniums start out with really tiny bulbs, but after four or five years, they're going to look like this, underground. Each one of these can be separated and generate a new plant in the spring. But you've got to be careful because they've all got very, very similar, if not identical, genetics. So you don't want to take a one plant and cover your woods with it. You want to have a variety. It's quite possible in the spring to come to an area with, some of these things cover more than a foot. You can take a knife or a shovel and cut a little pie out of it and plant four or five of them. You go to another plant, take a little pie out, and plant four or five somewhere else. Or you can do what we do a lot, is we take the, the plant, we cut it up, put, put the uh, little cuttings either in the ground or in trays. Here's what the cuttings look like when they start to grow. They're very hairy and pinkish. That's one of the ways you can tell them, at least in Illinois. Here's 25 of them growing in a tray. We'll sell this to a park district or give it to a park district or a school. And they've got 25 plants in a very small container <coughs> with a variety of genetic heritage that's ready to pop in the ground. Um, trillium recurvatum. Now most trilliums are not like recurvatum. Most trilliums have like one rhizome that does not have more sprouts on it. Recurvatum is different. So what I'm telling you about the rhizomes here does not apply to the other trilliums, but what I say about seeds will. Um, trillium 
has a bulb of sorts that I often describe when they're ripe as sort of like a Brock's chocolate candy. They've got ridges on them. How do you know they're ripe? Well, it's very hard. Sometimes you can see the seeds through the tissue, and if they're rusty brown or brown, they're ripe. If you do the Charmin test and squeeze them, and they're squeezably soft, they're probably ripe. If they're hard like a Brock's chocolate candy, they're not ripe. Inside the bulb, you can have anywhere from 10 to several hundred seeds with a little lysosome on them that is attractive to ants. You saw the ants collecting. Now, the problem we have is the invasive European wasp, the hornet that lives in the ground, has discovered trillium seeds. This wasp is stealing seeds from this trillium head that I'm trying to take a picture of. I have seen the wasps and the ants beat against each other on trillium heads where they're both trying to capture the seeds. Here are trillium seedlings. They look like grass. When I first started growing these, I weeded those out because they didn't look like trilliums. But I assure you, this is a trillium seedling. It's in its first year. And again, notice how little work it would take to put a couple hundred seeds in a tray like this and let it sit for a year. You got to keep it watered if it's not in the ground. You're better off doing what I showed you earlier with the trays you bury. Here are trillium seedlings as they grow. This is a brand new one. This one is about done with its first year. This is probably two years old. This is probably three years old. Somewhere between three and four years old, most trilliums get their three leaves. Before that, they can be confused with a lot of other things including Solomon seal, grass, and trout lily. Here are some trillium rhizomes that we've already cut. These can be planted individually. Many times you'll get extra buds growing on the uh, rhizome. You can put them in a grow bag. Let them sit for three years. <laughs> I mean, it's not rocket science. These are the common plants. Now, there are a lot of plants like lady slippers that have very special ecological conditions involving soil bacteria and soil type and all that. But your common woodland wildflowers, you can pretty much grow anywhere the soil and light and moisture conditions are appropriate. Here are trilliums in a raised bed. This is where we start getting serious. These are big. Unfortunately, people like to buy things in bloom. I gave up trying to explain to people at our yard sales that they really want to buy the small trilliums without blooms because they'll put their energy into growing a rhizome instead of a flower and seeds. They don't understand. They don't care. The one person that I dealt with like that that I really appreciated was a man who was about 90-something. He was hunched over clutching a red trillium in full bloom. And like an idiot, I said to him, you know, if you got the one without the bloom, it would be a lot prettier next year. He said, young man, I need it in bloom now. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I learned something. <laughs> Customers always right unless they're wrong. Those other people were wrong. This guy was right. Uh, Columbine, Aquilegia. This is a very beautiful plant. Hummingbirds are attracted to it, and it makes lots and lots of seeds. When it's not pretty anymore, this flower head turns right side up, and all the openings point up, and there's like 50 seeds in each little area. So there's like 200 seeds per flower. They're tiny little seeds, and when the wind blows, the plant goes like this, and seeds go like that, and like that, and like that, like Father with the holy water, you know? It's, this is a convent. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the seeds go everywhere. They're very tiny. Raindrops scatter them, deer scatter them, mice scatter them, little kids scatter them, your shoes scatter them. If you're not careful, you can get that plant everywhere. So what I do when I'm starting an area for somebody is I'll put a few of these in. I'll let the other plants 
get established for several years. And during those several years, I'll have them cut the seed heads off of these after they've bloomed. You can do this with many plants that make too many seeds. The idea is you've got the plant, but you don't let it take over by making millions of seeds. Okay, that's a warning slide that I'm almost done. Um, Bloodroot has these nice little pods on it that are green. You can't tell when they're ripe unless you use the Charmin test, which Mr. Whipple approves of, for those of you who remember those ads. If you squeeze many of these wildflowers with a bulb, that includes a, the true native celandine poppy, as well as these and several others, they will pop open and you'll see the ripe seeds in them. The ripe seeds here are a coppery brown. If they're green, you've killed a seed pod. With the celandine poppies, you pop it and the seeds just trickle out. You squeeze them and it doesn't pop open, they're not ripe. Charmin test is over. These are bloodroot seedlings. I've seen these grow on the surface of a tray where the raindrops had knocked them out even though I had a screen on them under snow. I, sometimes I peel the snow away and see what's going on. I have found these looking like that in snow, right at the surface. A little bit later, they look like that. This is a good time to plant them when they're about that big. You can also take the large plant, and it's got a whole lot of rhizomes on it. I don't think I have a picture of one here. I don't. I like that picture because the sun is shining through the little, little ones. But you can take the plant and you can cut the rhizome into pieces like you do with uh, the geranium and each one will make a plant in the spring. It's good to do that in the fall if you're going to do it. Uh, trout lily, eight years in many cases for a seed to bloom like this. It's worth the wait if you're not in your 90s. <laughs> they make a bulb that looks like this. When it gets much larger, it turns yellow. When it turns yellow, it's about ripe. They usually turn yellow, and after a good fall, warm rain, don't hold me to that, that's my observation, not my formal scientific conclusion, but usually after a rain, they will pop open. And when they pop open, the ants that collect seeds get them early in the morning, probably before you do, and the seeds might all be gone by the time you get there. So, you can take gauze, you can take vinyl window screening, you can take any number of things with holes in them, I like vinyl window screening, and staple it over the bulbs while they're laying on the ground. Frequently the bulb will detach from the plant before the seeds are ripe. So you can, you can screen them like this, then the ants can't get the seeds. Of course, you don't do that to all the plants because ants need love too. And the ants are important for turning your soil and dispersing your seeds. But if you want to get some of these seeds, sometimes you have to be creative. You can also gather up these uh, bulbs when they're still green, wait till they turn yellow and keep them somewhere safe. This is what the seedling looks like. I weeded these out for a couple years waiting for the nice trout lily looking thing to come out. This is what I should have been waiting for. It looks like some weird sedge. And the little seed cap is on the top and a little bulb is forming and they don't mind being crowded any more than Jack in the pulpit. There is a small fortune in trout lily in this little tiny tray. And in the fall, you can get the bulbs. The bulbs are here, you see how they're attached. Now again, one of the reasons you're advised not to dig up wildflowers, particularly in the woods, is this bulb can be quite a distance laterally and vertically from where it looks like the plant is growing. So if you grow them yourself and you grow them in trays, you can keep the little bulbs in the tray. You dump it out in the fall you sift through it and you find them. These are dogtooth violets starting to grow in the spring. This is a good time to transplant them into pots or around your area. They've started to grow. They're easy to find because if they're in your tray or in a, a flower bed of some sort, 
growing bed. You can find them easily. You can get a bunch of them, put them in a, a baggie so they stay moist, and go plant them. That's something I should have mentioned earlier. Anytime you're working with the roots and rhizomes, it's a good idea to keep them moist. We use a spray bottle and usually have them contained in a uh, container of some sort, like a bag. There's the bulbs. A Jacob's Ladder It's one of those plants. A good way to get Jacob's Ladder is to collect the little tiny seedlings next to the mother plant, just like you do with uh, Bluebell. You can also take a mature Jacob's Ladder plant and untie it. All these came out of one plant. I had a little girl working with me. She was six. I told her to count them. She went 5, 10, 15, 20. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm counting the money. Because <laughs> she knew we sold them for $5 a piece. So, um, toothwort. We're running out of time here. Toothwort, you can grow from seed. When they live in the they start making these little extra rhizomes. Each one of these can be taken and put in a pot. And somebody had asked me about or, um, dicentra. It's hard to collect the seeds because these little pods fall off early. This is what they look like when they're growing. Each one of these little bulblets will create a plant. And I think I'm about to get axed. Uh, you have about five okay, the last, I think this is the last one, but this is bellwort. I have a lot of trouble with this because I've never found the seed in the pods. I think I look very carefully, but I've never seen one in the pod. Here's one that somebody gave me. There's a seed. There's a seedling. I find the seedlings, so they must be seeds. The nice thing about them is if you want to propagate them, you let them grow for several years, you dig it up, you squirt the soil off with a hose, then you untie it. All of these came from that one bundle my son was holding. Now it's kind of tedious to untie, but it's not a Gordian knot, so it is doable. And you've got very viable, bloomable, the next year plants you can plant in your garden, in your woods, or have for a sale. And squeeze the Charmin if you want to see if the seeds are ripe. Lots of seeds. This is a plant that can get extremely aggressive. I was just told there's one in Wisconsin that's not native that's very aggressive, but the one I deal with back home, the northern range is central Illinois, so whatever you've got up here is different. And the plant looks like this as it grows. It gets obnoxiously big after a while. I just dig these out and kill them. This is the one you want this because this is good to grow for three or four years. Then they get obnoxious and need to die, but... So, with that, I will be done. We've got time for about two questions, two quick ones. You go through the process. Soil mixture, what do you use to put your seeds in? Just dirt from the soil? I take soil from my yard. We didn't which question. The question was, what soil mix do we use? And my basic answer is, we cobble something together. We take... Soil from the yard, if we have some around, or a neighbor's yard who was digging something. We take um, potting soil mix that we buy commercially in a 40-pound bag. We take a lot of leaf, ground-up leaves. We mulch our leaves, let them sit for a year, and you take the mulch. And we do about a one-third, one-third, one-third mix. That's not scientific. It's just what we do, and it works. Um, if you go into the literature, you'll find things about pH and things like that. But if you can come close to the soil you have locally in your woods, that's what I would try to do. Don't take lots of soil out of your woods because your woods needs that soil. And if you want to have some fun, go to the website of the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. Click on Illinois River and you'll see us moving soil by barge from Peoria to Chicago, dredged out of the river. They need soil up there, they don't have any. Our river is full of mud. We're taking it to Chicago in barges and using it as topsoil in parks, so. <laughs> yes? Have you ever tried to propagate Indian paintbrush? I've never worked with that plant, no.